Hello, my name is uh, Tony Kemp. I'm uh, a UK-based advanced nurse practitioner. Um, just to give you a little bit of, of background as we go into talk about mass gathering events and the role of advanced nurse practitioners, uh, and particularly with reference to referring, uh, reducing referrals to healthcare agencies. Um, my affiliations, I'm the Honorary Secretary of the British Association for Immediate Care uh, here in the UK, which is an association of uh, doctors, nurses, paramedics um, who uh, provide immediate uh, care um, at uh, events and also um, for the local ambulance services as part of the 999 system. Um, I'm an immediate care practitioner down in the southeast area. Uh, I live just to the south of, of London in the city of Tunbridge Wells. I'm also an academic of being a principal lecturer and the director of post-qualifying healthcare uh, at the University of Bedfordshire in, in Luton. So just a, by way of introduction, healthcare provision is really changing. Um, and we understand that really well within mainstream practice areas such as, as uh, primary care and uh, within secondary care areas within the hospital. But mass gathering medicine is certainly not mainstream and it's not particularly well understood. And the uh, provision that, that's going on there and the change that's coming about is really out of sight for many. And it occasionally comes into uh, focus as regulations are changed or when something uh, impacts, uh, which is a major incident or something like that. There's a, a level of literature out there that helps us to understand the role and impact of physicians within mass gathering medicine, um, but there's nothing about other practitioners. And in this day and age, we've got a whole host of others coming to the fore, uh, paramedics taking on different practitioner roles, people like myself as nurses who are working outside the traditional uh, uh, realms. So first of all it's, it's always useful just to have an understanding of what we're talking about. So for the purposes of, of my work I defined a mass gathering event as being a pre-planned event where people gather at a specific location for a common purpose within a predetermined time frame. Now that time frame can actually be quite extensive and you'll see from some of uh, the, the events I was at we're talking about many days with people camping overnight. Equally, it can be for a number of hours, such as a football match um, or, or other sporting venue. So let's just look at the issues that uh, I, I started to, to think about it as I, I started to prepare for this study. Well, first of all, the event bringing together this, this crowd of people, and some of them are, are very large, has a huge impact potentially. And it's associated with a range of demographics that others have, have, have pointed the way to. So, you know, if, if you've got a lot of people running around and, and there's a lot of alcohol going on, potentially they're going to slip and they're going to fall and there's going to be more um, uh, accidents and, and incidents arising. Equally, if you've got a lot of very elderly people, say at one of the uh, um, rallies that take place on, on Remembrance Day uh, for, for those who, who gave their life in the war and things like that, um, you, you may get a, a predominance of, of illness and chronic illness um, appearing. But also these events occur against the backdrop of everyday life. In the cities and in the places around where the events are happening, um, their, their life continues and all the incidents of life continue. Uh, and that includes sudden illness and injury. So you, you basically bring in a huge number of people and drop them into an already busy environment. Um, and the health services are expected to uh, carry on as normal. So the events that I looked at uh, basically occurred over 14 days. There were two air shows and two mili military reenactment re events. Um, it was a total attendance of around 842,000 people. So this chart just breaks down what each event was. The first event, um, one of the military shows, there were around about 125,000 people coming through with 15,000 camping on site. It was a five day event. They were resident on site. Um, and, and this in its own bring, bring certain issues with it. Um, for instance, they're camping, they're partying in the evening. There's a bit, alcohol starts to come to the fore. Uh, it was a bounded event. Um, and this simply means that it, it's within a, a clear boundary. So you have a, a clear um, footprint of, of where you're working, but there were a lot of unmade surfaces. Um, a lot of big vehicles moving around, tracked vehicles and things like this. 
uh, and uh, at, at times um, underfoot is, is extremely uh, precarious. When we, we look at the crowd demographics, highly mobile, a lot of people moving around. Uh, as I said, big density, um, quite, quite significant clumps of people in different areas. Alcohol uh, being around not only in the evenings but, but through the day to some degree. Relatively few drugs and it's primarily a family based event. And then you can see um, that in fact for the UK it was fairly warm, it was uh, 23 degrees average across those five days and the humidity was 71 isn't isn't too bad. And when you look at the, the other three events, you'll, you'll see similar sort of demographics. Um, and you'll see that with uh, one of the air shows, uh, event four, uh, sorry, event three, there was no perimeter, it was unbounded. It's actually in a city. Uh, and uh, that, that makes it quite challenging in lots of different ways. And just because it's got made surfaces doesn't make it any easier on the foot. When you've got huge density, and that was in fact one of the most dense, it only occurs over four days, and 600 odd thousand people there. Um, people don't see the curbs, they, they trip on them, they slip off them and things like that. So it, it introduces its own level of, uh, of, of problems. So the event medical team uh, provided by the uh, British Red Cross, who get, kindly gave permission for this study to take place, um, they're variable at each event in, in terms of different personalities appearing. There's a, there's a core team there uh, and to some degree some of the services are provided but, but fundamental to all. Um, the volunteers, lots of first aid personnel, ambulance personnel, and these are volunteers trained to a national what's called EMT standard. Uh, it's not quite the same as the government uh, standard over here um, but they do provide uh, a range of emergency cover for the uh, National Health Service here uh, as part of uh, local arrangements. And then some paramedic personnel, either uh, Red Cross personnel working as a paramedic or, or those brought in to, to help cover the event. The advanced nurse practitioner was in fact myself. Um, I'm a, uh, an accredited pre-hospital care provider by BASICS, the British Association for Immediate Care. Um, I hold the diploma in immediate care from the College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. I'm a prescriber and I've got uh, a lot of experience over many years in minor injuries and uh, illness. So this is where I started. Basically my null hypothesis was that the presence of an advanced nurse practitioner does not reduce the referral rates of patients presenting for medical care at mass gathering events uh, and, and referring them out to external healthcare resources. So I needed to, to test that hypothesis. So what did I do? Well, first of all, this was a prospective observational study. I was at the events and I was gathering the information as it came in. So I looked into the literature to understand what had been done before. And there's, there's a, a fair bit of work uh, from, from different individuals. And you'll see uh, some of the uh, references at the bottom of this slide. And I was looking for things like standard terminology. And I was looking for any descriptors that are there, particularly for, for routines for, for calculation. And I found these. So um, I, I received data uh, ethical approval from my own university, um, as well as, as previously stated, uh, permission from the British Red Cross. They do not have an ethics approval uh, system. We went into the uh, events and each morning there's a, a briefing for all of the event medical staff. So at that briefing, I just briefed them that there was a, a study going on, but they were actually blinded as to the purpose of the study. They were informed they would be asked a question on handover uh, of any patient into uh, healthcare professional um, uh, care. Um, all, everybody cooperated fully um, and this didn't deviate from normal routines. The purpose of myself being at these events is actually to screen everybody who the first aid and other HCPs on, on site would uh, potentially be referring out to external medical services. Um, I have other roles as well, but, the, but that is one of the key ones. Um, all of the situations had a main treatment post and I'd be based there and could also go out to uh, on-site emergencies as part of my role. There was a single question being asked on referral and it was recorded on a data sheet. And essentially, if somebody wanted to refer a patient potentially for uh, outward uh, referral, they would be asked, what would you have done for this patient if the advanced nurse practitioner was not available today. Um, 
if it, there was a very clear referral pathway within that that was recorded. If there was no referral pathway, then uh, a, a, another question would be asked to seek clarification. Where would you send them? Part of the routine that at these events, if, if a patient is uh, to be referred out, uh, and particularly if they re refer, uh, require transport out from the event, um, the duty officer uh, or duty manager is um, brought in so as to assist in the decision pathway around transport arrangements. Um, this is so that we, we don't have ambulances running off site willy-nilly. Um, and quite often when, when simple questions are asked, you actually find people have got their own uh, mechanisms of transport anyway. So we, we again stuck within the norms for the service um, and each day any patients who had been identified by the first aiders um, as potentially needing hospital or other health, external health care referral, their um, cases were discussed with the duty managers within the confines of the clinical information understood by the first data at the time, so as to determine what transport arrangements would have been made. So as I said, we were working within the normal SOP for this event. It was a tried and tested protocol that had been in place for the previous two years. Um, transport arrangements would normally have been made in the way that we, we were, were going through. And just to, to keep us in check, as part of the normal arrangements, on, there's on-site governance uh, available. And this is provided by two senior nurses um, and uh, followed normal patterns. There's a 100% governance review of all cases uh, very frequently within uh, the two to three hours of the patient being seen and uh, onward referred or discharged. And uh, very pleased to say there were no concerns identified at all. So the data collected across the event medical team was looking at what the referral reason was. The diagnosis is probably just a little bit too generous, but in first aid of terms, what they decided was going on and what was needed. The destination that was being suggested and the transport facility uh, or the transport mode that would be used. From the advanced nurse practitioner point of view, what was the terminal diagnosis? Whether there was a referral destination, whether they were discharged from care, um, whether ambulance transport was required and whether there was a prescription provided for medication. So when we looked into the literature to find out what was already out there, there were a number of, of uh, descriptors already in place and it was very important to, to maintain these for, for more longitudinal work that could be taken up uh, by others. So there's the PPR, the patient presentation rate, the number of patients within an event who present. There was the transfer uh, to hospital rate and this by ambulance uh, in, in previous work and that really just defines, uh, as it says on the tin, those patients who are transported out by ambulance. And then there is the RTH, R, the refer to hospital rate. So people being sent out from these events to hospital for, for treatment and assessment. In considering that, I recognise that there was one area that certainly was, was very much within our domain and, and potentially should be in everybody's. Not, not all patients being referred out necessarily need to go to hospital. Uh, in the UK, we have a minor injuries system. Uh, these are um, small units, uh, frequently nurse-led, sometimes with uh, x-ray facilities, sometimes without, and sometimes you know, that varies according to the time of day or even the day of the week. Um, and they can provide a, a number of, of minor injury services, uh, you know, small fractures, uh, suturing and things like that. And, and in some cases, uh, minor illness assessment as well. And of course, there's the primary care services, uh, the family doctors, the, the dentists, and the pharmacies as well, because uh, in, in the UK, certainly, um, they can provide a level of advice and care. And uh, th there's a level of practitioner rising in, in that setting with, with some of the pharmacists now being independent prescribers and having uh, the ability to assess and diagnose uh, at, at uh, uh, some injuries and illness. So it was a recognition that uh, some of the patients should be, might be, uh, being referred to these uh, other resources. So there was a new descriptor brought in that was referring to all local healthcare resources. And, and we felt that was really important to, to add into the mix there. By doing so, it meant that we, we, we captured 
everybody who was going to be referred to any endpoint uh, across the external healthcare uh, services rather than just those who would be escalated to, to hospital level. The calculation, well again, there was, very, there was a, a lot of clarity around that in the literature. Um, it was the number of patients, whatever subset, um, divided by the number of, of attendees and that by 1,000. And that was standard and we stayed within that, that process. Statistical analysis, I, I spent quite a lot of time looking at the statistics and settled on a one-tailed Fisher's exact test. And this is because the, the size of the sample. Um, although there were some who, who would suggest that actually we've got quite a decent sample, um, I was fairly clear uh, from my research that the ones the one tailed Fisher's exact um, was, was, was useful for the size of the sample that we got. And also because what we were generating was a two by two contingency table, it was categorical uh, data. And this fitted very nicely in, into the, the, the model of the Fisher's test. But I also wanted to look at the effect size. So uh, using Cohen's work, um, we selected the chi analysis for that purpose. So let's look at the data that we generated. Well, the footfall totally was around 842,000 people. Uh, and we were seeing uh, a patient presentation rate across all of those events for 14 days of 650 patients. And some of those are self-presenting, they walk in. Uh, some are called in in the sense that they've collapsed or something's happened and we are called to attend them. So that was a rate of 0.77 or 0.08%. When we looked now at the incidences between the event medical team uh, and the advanced nurse practitioner, we could start to see that across the different descriptors, um, the rates were remarkably quite different. So remember we had 650 patients as the presentation rate. So from the first, from the event medical team, which included first aiders and paramedics, they were going to refer 105 patients um, out to external medical services in total, of which 91 would have been referred to hospital. Now when you flip across and look at, at the advanced nurse practitioner, uh, that was uh, 23 were referred out to uh, external medical services um, and only 20 going to hospital. So we had quite a lot of difference then. You look at the percentage rates, you, you can see now um, that they, they are remarkably different. Transport, transport to hospital rates uh, by ambulance. From the information that the uh, event medical services gave, gave uh, and the discussion with the event officer, uh, they identified that there would have been 47 patients transported by ambulance. Whereas in fact, from the advanced nurse practitioner uh, becoming involved, only 11 of those were transported. Um, so again, quite significant differences. So when we ran the stats, we found that we had uh, uh, statistical significance was achieved in, in all three of those domains. And also that the China has demonstrated that we had a, a moderate, a uh, medium rather effect size. So we were onto something here that was, was uh, potentially um, valuable. So just revisiting that null hypothesis, it was rejected. The presence of a, an advanced nurse practitioner does reduce the referral rates uh, of presenting patients for medical care at mass gathering events out to external healthcare resources. And that was very clear. So let's look at the realities, and this is where the effect size for us was so important, to understand what this really means, uh, what it infers, and where it impacts. So just a, a quick chart, uh, and you can see there graphically quite a lot of difference between the event medical team, the red bars, and the advanced nurse practitioner, the green bars. So for instance, far left um, on the ED scale, 90 patients, the red bar, out to hospital. And then over to the right uh, on discharge, advanced nurse practitioner, just over 80 patients discharged from the same group. And, and you can see the balance is how, how there's a complete swing. So what was going on? Well, we could demonstrate a significant cost saving. Uh, and there's different sources of funding. So this was from uh, the King's Fund uh, 2014, 
and also from the tariff information from the UK government, we could actually isolate out what uh, different episodes of care or transport would cost per patient. And you can see there that for the event medical team, the overall referral cost was going to be in the region of 26,000, 27,000 nearly pounds. Whereas for the advanced nurse practitioner, uh, that had reduced to uh, just, just over four and a half thousand pounds. So it was a total saving of 22,000 pounds. The event medical team were working within their recognized scope of practice. So it wasn't that they were doing anything wrong. In fact, they were doing things very right. But they are very largely focused on referring to the emergency department. So 51% of their referral diagnosis to the advanced nurse practitioner, their referral diagnosis, so not the terminal one, but what they were suggesting was wrong, would have met the criteria for minor injuries unit referral, for example. So these are things like simple wound closures, uh, the, the, the lesser fractures and, and things like that. 16.5% of their referral diagnosis of that same group would have met the criteria for primary care services. People presenting for repeat prescriptions, minor illness, many of them uh, of a more chronic nature, and things like change of dressing. So people who've come away for, for a period, brought their dressing materials with them and want to change the dressing, or those who have become injured and seek a change of dressing um, at the event. And it is quite remarkable um, that at these events, very clearly the service is labelled as a first aid service. So all the flags outside clearly declare first aid, and yet we are getting people coming deliberately uh, seeking help um, around issues such as change of dressing, repeat prescriptions, and even for, for routine healthcare issues. There's been previous work from, from others who've demonstrated that patients do use event medical services in lieu of their normal health services in, in the UK National Health Service, NHS. So instead of going to a general practitioner, they actually appear or will take advantage of the event medical services and, and some even using for, for dental care, which is, uh, you know, quite seemingly quite bizarre given the, the nature of the service being advertised. The evidence also suggests that most events are dealing with mainly minor ailments. Now in the UK, there's a, a, a range of event medical reg regulations out there uh, that cover different types of events, both sports and mass gathering. And they're primarily focused around critical incident. Um, so when you actually look, it's around uh, emergency care, it's defined by risk, although that's not specified, uh, and, and looking at how many thousands of attendees are present. Uh, larger numbers escalate the level of cover. So typically we have start with first aiders, and as the numbers start to go up, more first aiders are added into the mix. And then we get ambulances, and in some events uh, and some, some uh, areas, it, it's with or without paramedics. And then we start to get the doctors introduced. Now, the truth is that critical incidents are really rare. Um, over the 14 days that we were caring for patients, we had three such patients. Um, one was a cardiac arrest. Um, one was a uh, isolated head injury and another one was a neurological event. Um, we had one of those patients died and, and two were salvaged. The cardiac arrest, in fact, was, uh, was successfully resusc resuscitated off scene uh, and taken into hospital. And, um, you know, it, it just shows that all those people, we only have three critical incidents and yet the level of cover is totally focused at that end of the scale. So what can we say? Well, first aid and event uh, ambulance staff, they're highly effective at providing very timely and very efficient care and advice. Most patients just anecdotally coming into the treatment centers are cleared within 20 to 30 minutes. So it, it, it's, a, it's a very efficient service, but there is a tendency to over refer. That's because first aiders are primarily trained to recognize and treat presenting symptoms. It's about pattern recognition. They aren't taught to discriminate. They aren't taught to taught to recognise uh, different potentials and, and to come down to differential diagnoses. Um, there's a lot of illness. There's a lot of allergy, anxiety, heat-related illness, and minor injuries that are over-referred. 
So people uh, appearing anxiety with hyperventilation uh, quite often would, would be uh, seen and regarded much more as being a respiratory based uh, a problem. People collapsing from heat related, related illnesses uh, weren't recognized for, for, for what they were. Um, minor injuries, particularly the, the twisted ankles, turned ankles, um, even though they were walking and coming in and, and presenting, uh, self-presenting, they, they would be seen as being necessary to refer out to the emergency department um, and primarily by ambulance. And yet, in fact, uh, those who did need further referral would be quite suitable to go to minor injuries, but many didn't even need that level of assessment. So there is really um, a, a problem perhaps within first aid education. Um, our, our first aid and our uh, uh, event medical colleagues really were working. They had to consider the appropriate referral pathway, anything but the most minor presentations. So a, a small cut, uh, something like that was relatively easy. But after that, they, they were thinking, where do we send them? Just for a moment, let's look at the role of paramedics. Their role is becoming more complex with the introduction of, of practitioner uh, amongst their ranks. Um, there isn't good definition in the UK as to what the different types of practitioners are. Um, it's not regulated. Um, we really need to, to understand what these practitioners can do. Um, and we, we really need to understand where they fit within mass gathering. Uh, I, I think they can be extremely uh, useful, particularly those, uh, as we talk about, as being paramedic practitioners or emergency care practitioners rather than the critical care. Uh, the paramedic practitioners are trained to recognise and work with minor illness, minor injuries, and, and have much more confidence in discharging from the scene. But there are issues around scope of practice um, for in the UK for paramedic practitioners with regard to medications. Um, so, for instance, within their NHS work, they can carry a range of drugs and, and, and administer, for instance, and start people on, on some of the, the, the more frequent antibiotics that they can't do when they're working outside their NHS practice, and that's a regulatory issue. They certainly bring increased experience and insight with more serious illness and injury, and there was a tendency for first aiders to underestimate in illness on occasions um, what's going on. So, for example, uh, people presenting with a little bit of breathlessness um, and it goes away with rest, not recognizing the potential for maybe cardiac involvement um, and, and, uh, and things like that. But these paramedics are much less well prepared for minor, Ill, Ill, minor illness and injury unless they're an experienced practitioner. So what were we seeing in this study? There are a number of things that were commonly referred totally inappropriately or would have been referred out uh, to the external services. All the musculoskeletal injuries, all 25, would have been referred, all of them, to the ED. Uh, in fact, only 11 were, and six of those went to minor injuries unit. Um, and this included people with uh, chronic back problems who, in the camping environment, couldn't rise in the morning because their back had gone into spasm. Um, and plans to longboard and, and to take out as a back injury, etc. Um, 20 wound closures would have been referred out to the ED, none to the minor injuries unit. Uh, they were all closed uh, at the event. Um, and then things like pre existing conditions. Uh, there were 12 of those who presented uh, through this route. Um, all would have been sent out, um, and uh, none of them would have gone to primary care. They all would have been sent to the ED, and yet these were pre-existent conditions. Patients were flagging as such, and only one of those, uh, it was somebody um, requiring uh, controlled drugs, they'd, they'd forgotten to bring their prescription with them, were, were sent out. So when we look at the issues around admissions avoidance, there's some interesting nuances here. Event medical services are there to fulfill the regulatory and insurance requirements for events. No more, no less. So effectively, and, and uh, then this isn't understood by the public, certainly, they are a private healthcare arrangement by the event organiser. When you look that there are a number of people coming into these events and positively presenting at these services in, instead of going to their GP, uh, instead of going to their dentist in some cases, um, that's not a message that's getting across. And they are there 
for the event. They're not there for around and about. However, in building up to the event, there's, there's a local licensing uh, system that needs to take place, and that arrangement includes health representatives, and they're extremely keen to avoid overburdening local healthcare services, particularly when you get these mass events. And uh, they are um, very clear on requiring a more robust on-site treatment and discharge system. Um, and they do so at the detriment of uh, the, the, the services uh, who are being brought in and these services are not there to do that and are not being paid to do that and also the staff who are largely brought in for many of the events are not trained or experienced in this regard now this study and previous studies have clearly shown that admission avoidance is possible the system we have in the uk is not sympathetic to that as its primary outcome or even its secondary and we do need to look at that and consider how we manage that. There are some recommendations coming from my work. First of all, further investigators uh, within this field should, should further standardise the reporting. Um, Arbon and Ranson Hutton have, have both uh, called for environmental and crowd uh, demographics to be included as standard. It's not there in, in, in many of the, the, the literatures that I encountered. I would strongly suggest that they refer to local healthcare resources as an overall um, statistic should be reported so as to reflect the total impact of the mass gathering on the external healthcare infrastructure rather than just focusing on those being sent to hospital. Now in the UK we have a government funded national health service so anybody can walk into a hospital to a GP and fundamentally get care. Um, where we have mass gathering events, the public are very used to this model of care. And yet, as we've explained, it's not there for that purpose. And yet within the licensing, there's a strong focus and even requirement um, to provide admissions avoidance. The government services actually need to look at the systems towards assisting with the funding of this. Um, and uh, the regulations need to look at whether this is an area that should be incorporated and uh, accounted for in, in, in the uh, staffing resources to these events. So my conclusions. Appropriately trained and experienced advanced nurse practitioners reduce the impact of mass gathering events on local healthcare resources. The focus is on appropriately trained and experienced. It's a very different world out in the field than it is in a minor injuries, a GP's uh, office, or in uh, an emergency department um, and particularly where people are going out the the injury or the illness sudden illness has just happened um, there's it, quite a lot of dynamics going on so these individuals need to be appropriately trained and experienced to work in that area uh, and not just come with uh, good skills from from more traditional areas it's really important that the regulations and the traditions encompassing medical arrangements at these mass gathering events do evolve to recognize the role and impact of advanced nurse practitioners at mass gathering events and as a caveat to that we need to go on and look at other practitioner groups. Event medical staff really need to be better familiarized with alternative referral pathways. Um, the ED is, is, is there but it, it's really for a very clear focus of patients and we need to help out staff to understand uh, alternate pathways that, that, that are there and many of these patients don't even necessarily need to be seen immediately um, so so we can give advice for some discharge with potential on referral if, if things don't improve and I would strongly suggest that the regulatory focus for event medical cover is actually poorly focused it's focused very much on the uh, the emergency care particularly the critical incident type care and yet we know that that is not what's really happening uh, and it seems that people are presenting much more with the, the minor uh, events and even with, for some for routine and ongoing healthcare needs. So thank you very much. Um, I hope that gives you a little bit of a, an insight into the work I've undertaken. Uh, you've got the reference to, to the paper there, but thank you. <laughs> okay.